buenos días a todos. Bienvenidos. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the fourth day of LACNIC 35. Most of you already know me, but uh, for those of you who don't, my name is Andrea Silva, and I'm going to be with us with you throughout the day. Today we have two very interesting proposals. So on the one hand, we have uh, some research on the deployment of IPv6, and on the other, we have a tutorial on DNS, uh, DNSSEC. Uh, let me tell you that uh, during the first session, you won't have a possibility to use the microphone, but we invite you to uh, ask questions in the Q&A panel, and the chat is only going to be used for comments. Now. Those of you who haven't joined uh, the Discord chat, do so, because they are very interesting discussions. Now we start with research uh, on the adoption of IPv6, where we will have two excellent speakers. Carlos Martinez is um, the technical area manager of LACNIC, and Sebastian Cabello, CEO of SMC Plus um, Digital Public Affairs. They will tell us about uh, the findings on the motivations for adopting IPv6 in LAC and uh, Caribbean based on recent research. So I leave you with Carlos and Sebastian, they'll tell us more about it. Gracias. You have the floor. Thank you, Andrea. Welcome, Sebastian, to let me share my slides. Yes, it's a pleasure to uh, greet you all. Thank you, Carlos. Let me tell you a bit of the background of this uh, study and what uh, this session is going to, uh, how we're going to work. Let me remind you that in 2016, I'm sure that many of you may remember, we conducted a, a, a previous study on the adoption of IPv6 in the region. At the time, it was through an alliance with uh, CAF, CAF. And we surveyed the adoption in the region at the time where we could go to people's houses. And we visited several organizations in the region. And uh, after five years, more or less, uh, we wanted to know what had happened in the meantime. So that is one of uh, the uh, answers that I, I think that uh, this very interesting study will give us some information about. I'm going to start by reviewing uh, a couple of numbers that you all love. I show this uh, frequently. I surveyed this yesterday, so they are absolutely fresh. Sebastian gives uh, similar data. They may change a, a bit because uh, it changes day, uh, uh, daily. But uh, what we want you to see is the general background, the general context um, of uh, the um, uh, adoption uh, status of IPv6 in the region. Let me tell you, I, I found this several days ago and I found it was brilliant to give you the context. Those two clips there are in a, a magazine that's called Mechan Popular Mechanics, Mechanica Popular, and that was uh, in 1997, and they forecast the death uh, of the internet because they said that the 32-bit uh, uh, scheme was one of the most uh, noticeable ways uh, of how the internet uh, was uh, not doing things right. So after those uh, uh, years, we we see that they were wrong, but there are some things for which we are suffering a bit. The numbers that I'm going to show you now, this is something that I like to highlight, and it is, what do they mean? What do the figures mean? Informally, people speak of IPv6 traffic. These numbers don't speak of the volume of transmission in megabytes or megabits per second. The percentages that I'm going to show you now have a different meaning, and it's as follows. When we speak of an X percent adoption, we are not actually speaking that that means traffic of megabits per second, but we say X percent of the users in that place have the possibility of managing IPv6 if they receive IPv6 contents. And it's key to say this because we can't say in most cases, it's not the case that if we have a country that has a 15% adoption of IPv6 among users, that 15% of the traffic 
measured in megabits per second is 15%. Surprisingly enough, depending on the type of operator, the volume of traffic will be over 15% because of the type of content that is hosted in IPv6. That's a lot of video, a lot of social media that are hosted in a IPv6 supporting systems. Here you have a very good description on the, that uh, shows you the methodology, how things are measured. It's very easy. It's presented with a, a more or less a randomized distribution of users. They are presented content blocks. One part is accessible through IPv4 and the other one through IPv6 and the other by two uh, via dual stack. And uh, we can estimate then how many users can access each. Let's see the numbers. I know you love them. These numbers have changed a lot in the last six months, especially in the countries that have started to appear here. If you compare this slide with the same that I presented in October or November last year, you see quite remarkable changes. You'll see how the map of Latin America uh, or South America starts turning to other colors. In the past, we used to have a lot of red and very little green. What we see in South America is that we have a number of countries with significant penetration uh, among the first uh, eight that I included in uh, this here. The lowest is Argentina, it has almost 18%. Paraguay that grew a lot in 2020. There's a very interesting story there, I'm sure, of the challenges that uh, the operators are facing in Paraguay. Peru that uh, um, after uh, after leading the pack um, in 2013, then they stabilized and now they're growing again. Brazil and Uruguay are leading with uh, penetrations close to 40%. And the French Guiana is in a uh, Lacnic region, but it's a bit different because the dominant operator there is France Telecom. And uh, so it's, well, we, we could argue whether that belongs to the region or not. Anyway, they have 37.5%. I, I, I want to speak of Colombia and Bolivia that also have significant penetrations. They are not in the table. Colombia has grown a lot in very little time in 2020. And we only have two countries in red. There you are. Now, Central America and Mexico. Mexico leads with a very high penetration, over 40%. They've also grown a lot and they continue to do so very quickly. Guatemala started to grow very quickly. It was one of the deployments in uh, Central America, if not the first, for a long time, it, they remained a bit stabilized at low percentages. Now they're growing again. Belize too, Honduras and El Salvador started to show symptoms of uh, adoption too. The Caribbean, traditionally in the region, it's... Uh, well, there, we, we, we could speak a lot about uh, what's happening in the Caribbean and why it's not perceived uh, as a need uh, for IPv6 in the Caribbean uh, economies. In Trinidad Tobago, they have quite a good penetration. It's a very interesting case in itself of what's happening in Trinidad Tobago. And Dominican Republic, they have a certain adoption that's becoming more obvious. Then there is a bunch of countries um, in the Caribbean. Well, they're not necessarily under LACNIC services. Then I have a couple of statistics that are interesting for operators and uh, the ISPs, and you'll notice why this is interesting. And it has to do with this graph. This is a graph that when, when I surveyed this number yesterday, I was very surprised. And uh, let me tell you that I was even a bit concerned. The IPv6 routing table has 124,000 routes. As a reference, the IPv4 has about 860,000 routes. So for a very long time, IPv6 routing table was marginal versus IPv4 table. 11,000 versus uh, 500,000. Now, for several years, the IPv6, um, the IPv4 
um, uh, table has grown uh, linearly and uh, IPv6 um, much faster. Now, as May last year, this was, we were here. Well, it depends on uh, the day, but uh, there's a remarkable change. A 50% interannual growth is a lot, and this has a very significant impact. And there's a type of routers that you need uh, for uh, this uh, scenario. In the case of IPv6 uh, assignments for LACNIC, this is growing a lot. And these graphs, the blue line is the number of uh, IPv6 assignments uh, for uh, LACNIC members. Each dot, each unit in that blue line is uh, a member that has been assigned uh, an IPv6. Uh, now there are 11,519, uh, and the red ones are the ones that are visible in the internet, 55% today. So now, after this introduction, let me tell you why. Why did we decide to conduct a new study? I, well, I already told you the end. We wanted to see what had changed in the last five years. And very particularly, we want to understand some more specific things. We want to study the behavior of the operators uh, uh, with regard to uh, the adoption of IPv6, reasons, motives, and barriers, why they don't do it. Those that uh, we would like to know the barriers of those that are willing to adopt it and uh, can't do it. And then we wanted to know why people decide not to adopt it. That's interesting too. We try to identify trends or tendencies uh, to be able to uh, adopt actions, uh, collaborating and for a greater adoption. Identify success uh, cases and potential business cases, comparing what happened uh, from 2016 to today. Some of these things, have no correlator in 2016 because, as a matter of fact, there weren't enough uh, operators uh, adopting uh, 26 uh, adopting IPv6. We didn't have enough uh, cases to identify the trends, so we had isolated cases. We tried to learn things, and I'm going to show you the report later. There's a lot of material about it, but now we are in a position, and this is a very positive thing in the region. We are in a position to be able to identify tendencies. We have a, a population of IPv6 uh, supporting uh, operators to see trends. So now I'll give the floor to Sebastian. And uh, you, um, I, I'm going to point out some issues later that I think that are particularly interesting. So the floor is yours, Sebastian. Thank you, Carlos. My greetings to all the LACNIC community. It's a pleasure to be here addressing you. This is really a very vibrant community. In addition to uh, the fact uh, that uh, we shared a lot uh, with the, the, the different members here, my, I, I had a chance to interview you, so I know many of the people behind uh, this uh, and uh, we know how LACNIC works and we know the members that benefit of uh, the uh, all the support. We are a young consultancy, consultancy which is focused on telling stories based on visuals and it is there that we try to build and understand where IPv6 was in the region and what was the situation back at that time. And that's what I'm going to tell you today. Carlos, please keep your microphone open and you can make comments as I go along. I am an economist by training, and this is a team where we had technical people. I might have interviewed some of you, and we strongly appreciate the fact that you were willing to participate in these interviews. But my focus is more from an economist, the standpoint of an economist. And those of you who followed the study and when we spoke about the status of IPv6 back in, 19, in 2016, we had a focus which was now 
changed. So Carlos told you about some of the objectives we had for this study. One was to show the current trends of the deployment of IPv6 in the region. Then the segmentation and to determine the motivation and barriers for not deploying IPv6, then the incentives and benefits for deploying IPv6. You also see here a classification of the different types of profiles. Then an economic comparative analysis was done of the deployment or non-deployment of IPv6, and then identify some of the conditions for this study. Now let us have a look at some of the statistics. And one of the things that stands out and that Carlos referred to earlier on is the impact of the pandemic. 2020 was a turning point because we see here that there was a major change in the number of IPv6 that were assigned. The last IPv4 blocks were delivered, and this shows the high demand of IPs that took place during the pandemic that led to the use of the internet for remote work, uh, working and homeschooling. And then this shows how the internet providers adjusted to this. And the exhaustion of IPv4 requires more serious evaluations in the sense of long-term policies. Now, let us look at the type of companies. These are the statistics of the deployment. These are, might not be the latest ones. These are by the end of 2020. And this shows the situation of the different countries and regions. It is worthwhile highlighting the relationship of South America, which is below the world average. And we have some countries such as Uruguay, Brazil, Ecuador, and others that have a higher adoption in the region. Mexico is way above that average. Now, in order to classify the behavior of the operators, we missed the opportunity of visiting them and maybe having conducted the interviews would have be more enriching. We had to opt for the virtual mode. So we interviewed 25 different operators, particularly the largest ones, but we also interviewed several content providers and platforms. What we tried to evaluate was whether they had deployed IPv6 or not, if they have assigned IPv6 or not, and to try to collect, for example, commercial information and technical information as, for example, the factors that led to the decision and other factors that had to do with the company in the sense of how to manage traffic and the use of the addresses. So what we found out was that there was a growth in the deployment of IPv6. You saw the statistics. And this is more like a kind of organic update. This is how we termed it. This had nothing to do with developing a business case that would involve an incremental significant cost. So this is like a change in the vision that existed. And this was organic in the sense that there has been a renewal of the teams and an update from the technological standpoint. They started incorporating IPv6, and this was done gradually from updating the backbone, the transport, and aggregation, and also regarding the management of the internal network. But this was not a specific priority. It just happened in a natural way. Also, regarding the use of devices, cameras, con gaming consoles, smart TVs, computers, mobile phones, all this led to seeing lack of symmetry. Many of these were already IPv6 compatible. 
but there are many smart TVs that still work with IPv4. And then as regards the support initially, at the level of regional providers, this was inadequate or poor. They still provide training so that the internet providers can accommodate the technical support to these new demands. And of course, this in addition to all the training activities provided, for example, by LACNIC. So the adoption of IPv6 depends, among other things, on the training of the capacity of the devices to use this protocol. Here we see, for example, as I said before, there are smart TV brands that only recently, uh, for the past two years, are compatible with IPv6. The same with the gaming consoles. There are two brands that are not compatible with IPv6 yet. However, there are other devices that have to do with the smart watches or smart home devices. These are more accommodated and adapted to IPv6. And one of the things that we can highlight is there are many CPEs that are only compatible with IPv4. And of course, these are cheaper. But nowadays, these are not high in demand. One of the drivers that we noted that account, that account for the growth and deployment of IPv6 were the expected growth of the Internet of Things that also goes hand in hand with 5G. You know, it's one of the pillars of 5G and also gaming. Gaming had a dramatic growth during the pandemic in Latin America and the Caribbean. This is where one of the regions where the most highest growth uh, were, was registered. There are apps that do not work. For example, change switching in brief sessions. And these are ones that are most demanded by corporate clients. The expectations that there will be 6 million devices connected by 2025, but this is still on the pending list. IoT did not sort of dramatically increase. It, it, this was expected, maybe like the deployment of electronic payment modalities. And those who are looking at the industry observe these leaps, but this hasn't happened massively. And the same with 5G. We expect that 5G only by the end of this year will begin to be deployed in the region in some of the countries. So there's still some time to go until this becomes massive in its reach and also in the sense of the quantitative leap in terms of IPv6 traffic. In the interviews we held, we were able to classify the people who were interviewed as follows. We established four quadrants. You can see on one hand, on the horizontal axis, those that have the availability of IPv4 addresses. And in the vertical axis, uh, significant growth in the business area. So in the dark gray area, there's a high concentration of those that are growing. There is high demand and that they estimate a high growth and they have also exhausted their IPv4 addresses. So these are the ones that are driving the growth and adoption of IPv6. There are many operators from Brazil and also smaller operators from Brazil in the top left quadrant. In the bottom left quadrant, we see optimized deployment. These are those who are not growing as intensively and they have some solutions like Carrier, Great NAT or Dual Stack. And in this way, they can overcome the demands they have for addresses 
and also reuse the IPv4 addresses. Something similar happens with what you see on the bottom right quadrant. These are those where we have uh, slow growth, but this is just done for as a result of exchanging their devices. It's like this is like a vegetative growth. Some players note that their business is not at the very best moment, and this is not really a business case for me making a significant investment in the sense of IPv6 deployment. And then we have some cases of non-deployment. Now, it might be interesting to make a deep dive in the case of the massive deployment of some operators in Brazil. We see here that there's a major growth in some cases and the lack of IPv4 addresses. And this was strongly driven by the pandemic. They have had to uh, undertake technical upgrades and the development of carrier grade act and quality deployment was achieved and they were managed to migrate to IPv6 successfully. There are other factors that played against this process. For example, the infrastructure to deliver 100% of IPv6 addresses was there, but clients were not yet prepared to do so, and there's still not much IPv6 traffic. And also they have the capacity to respond to corporate IPv4 clients that do not deploy IPv6. In addition to this, some of the applications or devices, as we mentioned earlier on, are not enabled for operating with carrier grade NAT. For example, some gaming consoles, smart TVs, or security cameras. So not the en entire content produced is accessible in IPv6. Now let us look at the economic analysis now. In order to study the incentives for deploying IPv6 and compared to the model of 2016, we tried to look at different variables. It seemed to us that the element that drove the IPv6 deployment would be happening as a result of the current value of the income that could uh, uh, encourage the deployment of IPv6 compared to maintaining IPv4 and providing NATing through carrier grade NAT or other dual stack solutions. So based on the survey of all the data we collected from some of the operators, the idea is that this should be an element that would allow all internet providers to establish categories in the sense of incorporating all the different variables and to determine under which situation they could classify the companies these uh, be carrying out these investments. So as we, we surveyed the use of a dual stack or a carry grain net and the flow of the CPEs today replaced or new and uh, the uh, revenues and uh, the investment costs, we see that to the extent that uh, what, in the, what is in the denominator is over, what uh, it would mean to maintain uh, yourself with IPv4, that will be a possibility of lost revenues. Maybe they can't uh, respond to that demand of a potential growth uh, demanded by the clients. If we translated this to a sensitivity map, we can put it like this. If we had demand there and how demand grows, 
you see if that it reaches from five to 25 percent that is if the demand grows 25 percent the the adoption there as a high growth uh, there's a high growth uh, by the clients there is low availability of ipv4 and it's obvious that the case is green and there the ratio is higher it's over 1.15 and there that is the case uh, uh uh, there, the lack of IPv6 is very high. So you have to go to the manager and uh, uh, show the business case because this is having a negative impact uh, on the organic uh, growth. If the availability of IPv4 is uh, medium to low, then uh, it's a mixed thing. It might There might be a point of balance and we consider that the point of balance is where the potential flow of maintaining clients, of increasing revenues goes ranges between zero and 10 percent that is over what you would get if you kept ipv4 and those that have little growth and still have availability or a medium availability you see that the ratio will be under one that's in red and there there are no incentives to for that leap if we put this in terms of the different quadrants that we showed earlier, and I hope that this is not confusing, but I want you to look at the dark gray, the aggressive adoption, where there's a high potential for growth and uh, for business. You'll see that the ratios are dark green or pale green. green. That is, that the potential growth and demand uh, reflect the need for ipv6 adoption if we look at the bottom in gray you see that as the commercial growth is not that is significant there you see that there are scenarios in red and in yellow or pale green where you see that they're going to try to delay the adoption of ipv4 because there is still ipv4 available in the case of the purple quadrant there it's obvious that there's no need for adoption because uh, there's a surplus of ipv4 and even the company may not be growing so that's a bit the situation so let's uh, compare some things let's see some of the elements that we found between one study and the other. What we can see is that in terms of the technical and operational uh, terms, uh, in 2016, there were many CPEs that were not compatible. The infrastructure had problems for transition. There were difficulties in the adoption and in the operations, the users, for IP4 addresses, there was a maximum of 10, and the equipment of the networks and the terminals did not support IPv6. Now, in 20, well, last year, actually, in 2020, we saw that the complexity of transition was not so high. The availability of uh, network equipments uh, improved. Of course, uh, there is a better know how. The suppliers uh, explained how to implement it, and also, so so the providers uh, um, gave better support. And then there was much more saturation of the number of users. Um, if we look at the business case, now there we evaluated that the cost of adopting IPv6 could be high that smaller members that didn't there were there were many uh, larger that members that didn't have ipv6 assignment and now most of them do except for uh, very few uh, he's uh, he's apologizing because they are drilling his neighbor is drilling it happens to all of us sebastian It's unavoidable, yes. It's typically it happens in the worst moment. And so 
we wanted to show you some uh, of the aspects of the adoption of, uh, well, then we have a growth of clients because of the pandemic. I don't know, Carlos, whether you wanted to speak because they are drilling at home, at my neighbors. If you ask me, I think that this slide is one of the most interesting things of the study because as a matter of fact, it summarizes the current study and uh, the comparison with uh, the 2016 findings. And there are a couple of details that show an, a, a, an interesting thing. In 2016, it was difficult to estimate, to, to compare, for instance, when the IPv4 markets, they were not mature enough. And the markets were not mature enough. Five years later, uh, like it or not, the market exists. May, we may not like the existing ones, but they're, they're more mature with more stable prices. So it's possible to make that comparison from the business point of view, it makes sense. I have a possibility of prolonging the life of the resource that I'm currently using versus what I'm losing for not adopting the new one. Well, it makes sense. And But the other thing is that, well, you see that gradually it becomes more and more convenient to adopt IPv6. Now, of course, in 2016, many people say, uh, said that they were a bit apprehensive about adopting a protocol that they were not familiar with, that they had to train their staff, etc. And of course, five years later, although that still applies, it's not so terrible, it's not as dramatic as it was in 2016. I think that to a certain extent, those are evolutions that could be expected, but it's good to check that it's really like that because it was intuitive, but we didn't have the confirmation. Uh, do you still have the drill? I, I still do. I, well, I, I, let's see whether, well, there it comes again. So here we can present some lessons learned so that you may see the growth of the business case, the implementation and the cost. Uh, I'm going to try to go on despite the noise of that drill. Another, this is one of the problems of teleworking. Yes, if you have a, if they're building something uh, near your home. Well, of course, uh, the business case depends on the profile of the operator and uh, we need to segment things clear because not all situations are equal. So we have to understand uh, what the demand is. That is why it's important when we speak of how to manage the network, we all know how you, how the uh, network equipment manages things with the current budget or whether they have to develop a business case and take it to the financial, um, the people in finances and the company and, and because today in any company, you have to show why the company should invest in this. And what we see is that this doesn't reach those C levels because it's not yet part of a, a strategy beyond the fact of the technological change. However, the growth of the demand is there. And although some things have not exploded, there is an organic growth and the pandemic is showing that and the limit of addresses has been achieved. So it has been reached. So the business case is there. That is why we're going to make this model available so that uh, you may use it. All uh, the uh, LACNIC members may use it to evaluate how to forecast their business. In terms of implementation, what we see is that the coexistence of the two protocols will continue like that, and the optimization of the use of IPv4 addresses will go on. But increasingly, there will be contents that are going to drive the need of using IPv6, of course, all those services like gaming that uh, need a lower latency and 
and the industrial solutions, obviously they'll come ready for IPv6 and the companies that want to provide services to the corporate world will have to adopt it, whether they like it or not. And in terms of costs, the costs allocated for IPv6, it's been proven that they're not significant and that they get, uh, uh, um, they get dwarfed, uh, dwarfed when uh, you consider the better services that you can provide. Finally, in closing, the adoption barriers in the end have a lot to do with uh, the fact that the users are not fully aware of the things because this is not necessarily visible to all the users. On the one hand, we have that there are still devices and the end to, uh, users that uh, oblige the use of dual stacks. So sometimes the traffic, although the content was developed for IPv6, then you, you have to prevent uh, preemptively uh, transfer it to IPv4 and also having cheaper devices operating that, uh, that are IPv4 only is a problem. And that there is still some content and platform providers that continue to work with the old protocol. In terms of client requirements, what we see is that this is not so significant, except for the very specialized, because, well, some of the benefits of IPv6 are not perceived, or at least you, no, you can't, uh, unless you are specialized or you are more concerned about security, you won't be able to see them. Well, Carlos says that that's a very interesting thing and very often it has led us to discuss uh, the, dis the incentives for adopting IPv6 because many uh, providers say, well, my customers are not requesting it. And somebody summarized, well, Actually, the clients didn't ask for IPv4. They don't know, they don't mind. What the client expects is a service to operate properly. And as IPv4 gets depleted worse and worse, it's difficult to maintain the same characteristics of the net that we know in IPv4 than in IPv6, because we have to move to technologies that may enable us to share public IPv4 address that are not free of charge. It, it's, it's not that the service is the same, it's the service is not the same. It has a delay, I have a restricted number of ports. So somewhere I have to make restrictions to be able to share public IPv4 addresses. So the clients are not requesting IPv6, that's true, but actually what the clients want is a different sort of things. They want a service as they had in the past. They don't want to be worsening the services. And here I go back to gaming because it's something that has been mentioned once and again. Maybe if you were connected to the peering forum on Monday, there was a panel on e-gaming and the issue of IPv6 appeared and the issue of the delay for gaming, e-gaming is essential and they're worried about it. There are companies that are investing uh, quite a lot in having clean uh, net, uh, paths um, so as to avoid this problem of the delay. And for them, it's important to have IPv6. Seba. Eh, no, bueno, a ver, con esto, con esto estamos ahí. A ver, eh, en temas de faltas de incentivos, también well, lo que vimos... the lack of incentives in that sense. There have, seen, there have been some regulations that have been of help. Not all the governments have the same vision to promote this. And of course, the government's clients have been a major driver. We saw this in Ecuador. We saw this in Colombia where it was determined that the government the government should migrate and that all the solutions should be deployed with IPv6. But this is not for all countries. We see this also in Brazil. Brazil is one of the countries that is at the forefront in the terms of penetration. And there has been a driver that has worked well. So that is the 
paper we produced, and of course it's much longer and it contains many more details during the qualitative interviews with some of the content providers and more well-known providers like Google, Facebook, Akamai, Netflix and others. This material will be available later on, but I hope this was of interest to you. Thank you very much, Sebastian. I hope you found this of interest. Do, I think we have time for questions, so I now give the floor to the Q&A secretary so that he can read out the questions. Thank you. The first question is from Ramon Flores. I think this is addressed to you, Carlos. He says, Nicaragua also deploys and announces IPv6. Why doesn't this appear in your table? <laughs> Ramon, I had seen that question and congratulations for those who are carrying out the deployment. The thing, it doesn't appear in my table because although I did not mention that is quite true, I tried to include those countries that at least have 1% of the users in IPv6 and the latest information I have from Nicaragua is 0 0.10. This does not mean that they do not continue to work on this, but there is a delay between the deployments take place and the statistics then reflect this. So maybe by the next opportunity of this presentation, we'll be able to include that. There's a question from Marcelo Oliveira who says, firstly, congratulations for the perfect presentation. In your opinion, what is the greatest general resistance to the adoption of IPv6 in the world? Well, the world is a bit too big for me. I would rather limit ourselves to the region, to our region, because this is what we know best. But of course, it's interesting to look at the world because we can compare. But I think Sebastian's last slide, or his second last slide, showed some of the things that continue to be barriers. This in terms of, well, on one hand, the perception of the need, this varies from one operator to the other. There are some operators that do perceive the need for IPv6 and others that do not, and for different reasons, all of which are valid. Would you like to add something, Sebastian? Yes, the thing is that we don't see resistance, but maybe lack of incentives if your business does not grow. You don't wish to invest in anything at all, basically. What you want is to reduce costs and check and see whether the IPv4 blocks are being used or not, and if not, they are reused, and if through dual stack and carrier grade not, the updates can be managed, then they do so. But if your business is growing, the incentive is there. And if you wish to distinguish and stand out in the sense of support and the offer you provide to your clients, this is fundamental. So I think it, this is not about resistance, but rather lack of incentives, and many at present, and the network teams and the network divisions of a provider still does not have the business case to raise their hands and go to the financial department to say we have to do massive deployment of IP6. But that is what we're doing here, and we wish to help the technical areas so that they can make the case. And you always have to present a business case, otherwise you don't get the money from the finances department. There's one thing that I would like to add to your comments. And we speak about different realities. I like to compare the reality in Argentina, which could be like Uruguay's with certain variations and the reality in Peru. Why did Peru do the first, was first deploy? And this is because the market realities are quite different. The broadband market in Argentina and the access to internet was saturated but much before the exhaustion of IPv4. This is an exhausted market. There is a vegetative growth because of the growth in the population and users that go from one operator to the other. So the number of users is more or less stable. It's quite different from an economy that develops at a later stage and all of a sudden there are many people who have access to the internet. So you have to provide access and you're already late to the IP distribution. So you have to figure out solutions somewhere or other. Thank you. There is a question from Eduardo Breve. He says, do you have a cost estimation of IPv6 deployment in an ISP and how would you recover the investment? Did you study a business plan in the sense beyond the increase in the number of end users or traffic consumption? 
Well, we did assess many variables, but because the variation in terms of size is most significant, there's a strong lack of symmetry. And we saw different numbers and we made estimations, but we never had the complete numbers of a company because, of course, these belong to each company and they wouldn't disclose these and we would not disclose them either. But this, the paper, the report will be ready and LACNIC will include it online as they have done with all these reports. This is so that you can look at the different variables that we included. Let me remind you that if you have any questions to please include these in the Q&A section. We are not reading out the, we're not opening the microphone in this session. The request from Maximiliano Colas. I'm sorry if you mentioned this earlier, but I just joined the meeting in my country. I see that one of the barriers is that the IAPs are those who don't provide the services. In those cases, we only have the tunnels to resort to, or is there some way to incentive the ISPs to implement IPv6? And I add, if my ISP wishes to implement this, but the upstream of my ISP does not implement it, what can I do here? Well, that's a good question, in fact. I am confident that this is a reality that of many of the cases we mentioned in this case, I had a routine in my calendar, and once a year, I wanted to implement IPv6, and eventually this was done in Twitter but there's not much more. It's quite different, for example, in the case of a corporate client, there you can go to the business executive, accounts executive, and present a business case and say, well, I need this case in order to achieve this thing. And our Q&A secretary, Guillermo, in one of his previous roles, did exactly that. And this was the most interesting case, I think. I always found it so. So we are almost out of time. There is a comment from Eduardo Preve who says, that is why I insist, shouldn't the technical team go to the CEO with a business plan in order to deploy IPv6? I think this was already answered. Guillermo, we have time for one or a couple more questions if you wish. Let me make a comment on what Eduardo stated. Yes, I think that is interesting, Eduardo. Now, I have, if you are in a small or medium ISP, there are many things you have to struggle with when you go to the CEO, so you really study this carefully. And at a some time, IPv6 might become re relevant, but you needn't have to provision international broadband and peering and so on. So, as part of the technical book, you have to decide in which order you wish to present your business case. And that is why we have this model in order to try to raise that business case to the CEO to the, or to the financial department to study the demand of your clients or also which other clients you might lose of not providing the optimal solutions. For example, not having to use a carried gate net. It's not optimal. It might work, but maybe the competition is providing better solutions than those that we provide. So those are arguments that might resonate to those who might have to make investments. So this is above the investment of what you invest in the network. There is a question, a comment by Jordi Palette. He said, I have several observations to make, but I will make these once I see the complete study. Or if Sebastian has an email address, I can send this directly to him. Maybe you can include your email address in the chat. However, I do have a very important observation. I don't know if this was taken into account. And this is that the deployment cost is not the same if instead of dual stack, it is IPv6 only with IPv4 as a service. I don't know exactly what you mean with IPv4 as a service, Jordi. If these are the offers of distant providers who do reverse DNS6 in the United States, these are not very pra much practiced in the region. I think that market 
won't go anywhere. At least I am aware of two people who are in that situation and abandoned this. If you say, my people, as a service within your own network, well, in that case, there could be some there, something there. But it's good to continue uh, studying this. That's the comment. Yes, George, exactly. It's not the same thing. You really have to summarize information somehow or other. And I do agree that that is a detail where one could do some more detailed analysis. Carlos, allow me to add something there. Yes, Guillermo. This study is based on interviews with operators from the region and based on the conclusions of what the operators are doing. And the operators that were interviewed, none of them is deploying these technologies, neither MAP nor 464XLAT, but they are deploying dual stack with carrier grade NAT, but not IPv4 as a service. So the study is more based on that, more focused on that. Yes, that's quite true. Yes, we have one from IRP1 who is responsible for verifying the deployment and IP, the deployment application of IPv6 in each country. Regarding my numbers, it's not that there is an organization responsible for verifying and applying this deployment. We have different statistics and metrics that you can find in the internet. This is the measurement of the adoption is very sensitive to technology. Without going out to ask each of the operators how many IPv6 users they have, it's very difficult to find that information. Any of the, all these methodologies have major limitations. Like the one that APNIC applies, this has been the reference for all. And they use the Google services because the Google services can be viewed almost everywhere and can be controlled. You can have a certain control on the distribution of those announcements. It's not perfect. We are aware that they underestimate the mobile deployments because in the de mobiles, you don't get that announcement. And in many regions of the world, for some reasons, Google has been blocked. So they underestimate the presence of IPv6 in that area. So there's no perfect methodology. And sometimes we have to resort to other proxies and other indicators in order to have supplementary information. It also happens that very often you go to the APNIC statistics and you see a number, and then you go to Akamai statistics and you see different numbers. Now, the point is that you have to try and understand what they wish to convey. It is not easy, and it's not that there is someone responsible for doing so. There are serious initiatives to measure things to, to understand this phenomenon. So the last one from Mark Urban. It, could it be that there is an important proportion of technical teams that don't even have an incentive to go the CEO with a business plan for IPv6? And if that is the case, why does this happen? Is it only due to lack of knowledge? In the interviews, it happened to us that were all very much up to date with this because probably these were the larger operators. I think that the technical team all wish to have the best performers. I think that none of these technical teams is a team that is somehow complacent. I think that particularly those who are related to LACNIC and those who participate and understand the development as to where things are heading, they understand the importance of migrating to IPv6. We never came across anyone that did not have that incentive. However, in most cases, many of them were trying to over, were unable to overcome this considering the circumstances they were living. Let me add on to what you're saying. At LACNIC, we have an experience previous to the 2016 experience. These were meetings we organized back in 2014 in order to notify the people that the first exhaustion change stage of IPv4 was beginning in 2014. And at that time, people stared at us and say, well, what is going to happen? That was seven years ago. And of course, people now are aware of this and take that into account. 
so I think there is no lack of lack of knowledge practically at this stage, and that is good. So we are past 10 minutes, so I think we can wrap up now. Dejarles, bueno, nuestra información de contacto, la mía ya la tienen, la de Sebastián la puso en el chat. Eh, agradecerles por estar acá con nosotros y le doy la palabra a nuestra. I want to thank you for being with us and I now I give the floor to the Master of Ceremonies. Yes, the same for us and all the team of LACNIC. We have really learned a lot. We worked wonderfully well together and the gentleman of the drill that finally stopped. So I appreciate that. <laughs>